We are recording on behalf of the International Intercommunalist Convergence, which is a united front of various leftist, socialist, communist, Maoist, Bundist, Pantherist gang of people. Hell yeah. And what we want to do is to talk to you all about what you don't know about politics, because you know that you know enough about politics already. It's just that the question is how to make some new politics. And this is what the, the Bund has been trying to do since a long time. This is what the Panthers have been doing. Now they call it sectoralism, but it was invented by the Bund and by the Black Panthers. And uh, it, it's not recognized as such by the great theoreticians of sectorialism, which is the opposite of sectarianism, I suppose. Yes, it fits. Doesn't Coalition it? struggle, stuff like that. Like, yeah. um, it's sort of understanding that, like, I, I mean, think of social democrats. Like, we're going to talk advanced theory. Uh, the advanced theory take on social democrats. We talked about this last stream, actually, is that they're basically social fascists. It's, nevertheless, they still are on the left. A lot of working class people on the left follow them. And so we need to be willing to work in united fronts against, let's say, fascism, even though I've just called them social fascism, yeah. because it's not only strategically important that we not stick our fucking fingers up to a lot of workers that are supporting social Democrats. You know, we should expose the leadership of those social Democrats make them look like asshats. And then while we're in a united front, we can pull those workers to us. And when they, the social Democrats eventually turn on us, hmm. we pull ourselves out the united front. And so basically we're, we're putting it on them to, to be the, the more sectarian of the bunch to try and push away while we're trying to show not our love for the social democratic petty bourgeois, but our love for the proletariat that get caught up following them. But also mm. the strategic nature of trying to fight against fascism, that there's no mm. point shooting bullets. And well, might as well be your own quarter at that point. It's a live or die situation, you know, so you, to fight against the barbaric existence of fascism, you are going to find yourself sometimes in a... Uh, what what we would call a popular front, which is a, a united front specifically made around a single issue, essentially, like fascism. Um, the, the, the Nuevo de Popular um, that's spawning in France is a fine example of this. America needs this right now, is what France has decided to do, which for whatever problems it's going to have, oh, it's going to have problems. It's great that they have managed to form a united front that's saying, no, we don't want neoliberalism. We don't want fucking fascism. Mm. Piss off. And it's in the name of the popular front of the 1930s. Yes. <clears throat> and uh, it's better even than the popular front. Uh, you know, tomorrow's the election in France as well, which is going to determine, you know, what happens here. But <clears throat> the united front that they have, you know, they call it the new popular front. But it's not a popular front with a bourgeois party, you know, a centrist party. You know, they couldn't care less about Macron. They're not going to form a united front with Macron to oppose the fascists. No, they want the left to oppose fascism because that's the real thing. Macron, he set this up for the fascists to win. <laughs> you know, really, he saw the fascists were coming up, you know, European elections. And he figured, you know, like, uh, you know, like this is better than having, you know, Mélenchon becoming, you know, president of France. Can't allow that to happen. So, you know, like let the fascists come in to stop or stall the, the leftists. You know, this is, I'm sure is what Macron's strategy is all about, why he called it a quick election. Hmm. But did the funny thing of then declaring that he wanted to enact conscription just after calling for an election? These guys aren't good at holding on to power. This is a real David Cameron moment right here. Hmm. Um I'm gonna, I'm gonna like step down from my position if the people vote to leave the EU. And it's like, fuck. Like, I wonder how many people voted to leave the EU just because they want David Cameron to fuck off. You know, yeah. like I wouldn't blame them. I mean, they'd be doing something good by wanting to leave the EU, but for obviously for not the the right reasons. <laughs> or is it the right reasons to want David Cameron to fucking find a ditch and fuck it till he doesn't exist? Anyway, he's gone. Okay, so now you're no, in he's the... in the cabinet at the moment. Like oh, the no. little shit's yeah? back. Oh, la, la, la. Yeah, he's the foreign minister, the Lord uh, Cameron. Now he's he's evolved. Oh really? <laughs> and now now we've got Lord Starmer as the fucking prime minister. 
Oh, is um, he a lord too? Wow. Yeah, yeah. And so Cameron's gonna be the shadow. Unless unless um Sunak's gonna shuffle the shadow cabinet. Uh Cameron will be shadow foreign minister now. Fucking hell. I'm getting used to this new election shit. Um uh, Labour literally has a warmonger um in at the moment, like a guy who like gets horny over nuclear warfare and has suggested striking like empty land in different countries as like a is show this, of force. Uh, is this Lammy? Is this Lammy who's the foreign um, minister now? Uh Wes. Like the don't know about he's got that like guy. long hair. He's kind of young looking. Really? No, I don't know about that. But I think Lammy is the foreign minister now. The black guy. I um yeah well it's uh that well, Labour has to have one minority, and so that people know that they're not oh, racist properly yeah, yeah, after yeah. they and like a woman. Kicked, one woman, uh, one black guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, they but, kicked uh, an Arabic woman out um, oh. because she talked about the Islamophobia that she had faced inside the party. So they oh, they yes. kicked her out uh -huh. the party when she had just won her election. Yes, we need to know more from you about the uh, about the British election. The not so great Britain has had an election. And now, supposedly, the Social Democratic Party, the Marxist Party of the Second International, is now in charge of the whole country. And what are they going to do with it? What are they going to do with it? Target Nothing. trans people, uh, push for war, like oh. like world war, push for war. Oh. Literally go on about how willing they are to use nuclear weapons. That's that's comfortable. Like I'm a skeptic of the possibility of mutually assured destruction, but it's still not nice. Some of the hearing some of the shit these people are saying, but nevertheless, hmm. um, uh, austerity is going to increase. Uh, privatization of the NHS is a part of their program. They've already said that the way they're going to cut down on waiting lists is by uh, uh, integrating the private, like uh, the private whatever the fuck. But that's uh, the opposite the of what they did in the first place. They're the one, the Labour Party is responsible for the National Health Service. I mean, it? they were also responsible for the privatizing of it. Um, they, they did what Thatcher couldn't, and that was target the NHS. That it wow. backfired on Thatcher when she tried. But this is, this is, how could they do that? I mean, they're, it's their own party's program. You know, they're the ones who are brought, you know, health care. In, you know, that's the reason, you know, you know, why they exist and, and they want to destroy it. Well, it's a social democracy got really weird in 1987. Okay. I mean, it already has gotten weird multiple times. Social democracy, it's a plague. But yeah, um, this this labor lord called Anthony Giddens um decided to make his own little offshoot of social democracy, which um he called it the third way. I don't know if I, that already gives like the, ooh, what's he going to say here? And the gist of what he pushes for is essentially like a crossover of like fascist, social fascist and uh, neoliberal economics. Um, and like, uh, you know, that's something that Labour under Blair supposedly pushed. Though Giddens criticized Blair and said he injected too much neoliberalism into the third way, which is one of the funniest sounding criticisms ever. Um, hmm. I, fucking Blair's the kind of guy who was injecting all sorts into himself, so who knows? But the fucking um, Blair and his fucking like insane life aside, um, Keir Starmer is very much more like what you would say is like what Giddens expected out of the third way. Uh -huh. And he's going to be a very, very brutal prime minister. Uh -huh. um, being a human rights lawyer, turns out you're one of the shittiest people around. Uh -huh. And um, I mean, anyone here who knows how human rights works under imperialism and capitalism, You'll know why human rights lawyers are some of the shittiest people sometimes. Not always. There are definitely people that do good work out there. You know, we need human rights law and stuff. And that oh. also means we need the lawyers. But the ones that do the, the Crown Court stuff are something else. The Crown Court is fucking evil. And, like, every institution associated with it is fucking nasty. 
you're lucky if you find a good judge or a good fucking lawyer and that kind of business you know the, those people are out to prosecute you if you're on their fucking table and especially if you're poor you're you're a problem you're bothering them you're getting in the way of their day at that point you know what's their mindset mm -hmm. wow okay so uh we don't expect the revolution to be led by the labor party i guess that's uh definitive they're still enough. tracking behind a bit you know yeah Lenin's okay, criticism but... still stand. Yes. But uh, G Jeremy Corbyn was elected as an independent. So now Sturmer, St Sturmer, he can Sturmer. Sturmer. <laughs> <laughs> he, <laughs> he cannot expel him from the House of Commons. One, like he did from the Labour Party. Two, he cannot shut him up, you know, like because he doesn't run the House of Commons. It's, it's the Speaker of the House, you know, who lets him speak, you know. And Jeremy <laughs> and, ran as an independent as well. That's the cool thing. Cool, yeah. I, he should have done that years ago. I mean, it's a bit opportunistic that he's done it now rather than ages ago. But I'm kind of glad to see that Palestine was the issue that made him go, nope, I will be expelled from the Labour Party. Palestine is where my solidarity is at. Yeah. Fuck you. And he's gone about things that way, which I mean, anyone who knows the history of Jezza knows that that's how he is when it comes to like stuff like this. He won't back down on those things. And it's why I was really disappointed when he wouldn't just turn around and explain that being anti-Israel is not anti-Semitic when that uh, member of the Labour Party got under fire because of their anti-Semitism. <laughs> Yeah, when that started to happen. When they didn't actually say anything anti-Semitic, if I remember rightly. I might be confusing two events. Maybe there was a really shitty event that I'm missing, but I remember it being about someone criticizing Israel. Hmm. I might be wrong. Uh, Labour Party definitely has does have an anti-Semitism problem. No, he, he Corbyn has never made any anti-Semitic comments. Never. No, it wasn't from Corbyn. It was from someone on his like side of the Labour Party. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, yeah, they can always find somebody like that, you know, like to smear um, the whole movement with. But uh, the movement rejects anti-Semitism, rejects any people who propose anti-Semitism at demonstrations and excludes them. Generally speaking, this is the case. You know, it's not a, um, it is not a big problem, but amongst the population, it is a big problem. This popular sentiment, you know, is expressed, especially in the United States. There's libertarians who are going around saying, you know, that the Zionists are representative of the entire Jewish people. And since Zionists lie, then all Jewish people lie, et cetera, et cetera. So they're using it as a justification. Zionism becomes, you know, like a justification for anti-Semitism these days. It's 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 pathetic, you know. And yet they claim they still, you know, but do they care? You know, they don't care. You know, they're generating anti-Semitism. No, not at all, because this fits into their whole schema. You know, they want all the Jewish people in France, what, 300,000 or 100,000, whatever. They want them all to leave France and go to uh, Israel, you know, where nobody speaks French. <laughs> Oh. Well, the thing is, as well, is that's genocide of the Jewish people here. As much as it's beautiful that the Jewish people can finally have connections with the, you know, with Alistair, with Canaan, you know, it's still like, you know, Israel's at the point where they're kind of committing ethnic cleansing and on the behalf of like European fascists that want Jewish people to be eradicated. Think about how many Jewish people left, not because they wanted to move to Palestine, but because they were afraid to live in Europe. Yeah. And, how... and there was no defense, you know, if the Zionists were organized and they had militias and all that, then why didn't they come to Europe and defend the Jewish people there so they can? Exactly. Do you know what? They're able to form a fucking what is basically a death squad in Canada and the US to go terrorize. I mean, even people like yourself and fucking, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, he goes to Lebanon a lot. Uh, Finkelstein. You know, um, so they, they've got enough, they, they're able to get their fucking terrorists out there when they really fucking want to, but they weren't able to form a militia to fight against fascism yeah. and make Jewish people safe. And what is also their homeland? This is the thing. When you have dual heritage, you have more than one fucking homeland. Hmm. and a right to those homelands and there's hmm. this thing with europeans where when someone is like, like embracing their colonized nationality it's basically fuck off fuck off back to where you come from then it's like what the yo no that is not how we work with things because hmm. at the end of the day uh, you're one generation in on a land well you have national rights to that land you have grown up around that culture which means that you have some form of like a custom to that culture so like obviously that that varies of colonialism and other stuff like that but if if like someone's in the first world and they've lived like that 
I, like I have no other reason than to like respect the fact that they have a right of being considered English, but also being considered where they they natively come from. Um, this is not the same for when colonizers go move into colonized people's places because of specific reasons related to the dynamics. But this is sort of a thing when it comes to people coming over into the first world. And it is one of those things that comes into being colonized. As colonized people, colonized people have a right to take the culture from the people that were oppressing them. Hmm. It's another thing as well. Yes, and you're a very good example, you know, of having a dual identity, you know, because you are Celtic and you're living in not so great Britain. Uh, so you, <laughs> you have a dual identity, you know, like one is a citizenship, the other is a nationality. Citizenship. Well, and I do also have English heritage too, so I have dual. I'm a I'm mixed. Uh, well, I'm mixed race basically, if you want to put it in that sort of context. Mixed nationality. Yes, yes. You know, race was the old term used in 19th century Britain to refer to uh, to to nations. You know, because it, it fitted into the imperialist, you know, colonial mentality. You know, to think that that the uh, colonials, you know, were not of the same race as the well the um Britons, the Brits. With the way they did it with us, they were very quick to sort of like drop us in the same category as uh black people from Africa. Um uh, I could like find um uh a picture where they were drawing uh it's from British propaganda about Irish people oh. and um it's like looks spit to spat as like US propaganda about black people where they draw us like apes. Huh. Um, I can't remember what ape it was that they did. It might have been chimpanzees, but um, they drew us as apes, stuff huh. like that. Um, there's this, there's um, they both use the N word for us from the get go of the N word being a thing uh, in lexicon for denouncing someone as impure. It comes from Latin. Um, the, uh, what's it, they were, they also made, uh, another version of that word where they added oid on the end, which means to be like, or akin to, and that was mm. specifically made to target the Irish when the, uh, when colorism started to come in more, because as you know, race didn't actually have that much to do with color until like, God, maybe like the 18th or 17th century. Like, like people commented on color, but it wasn't really why you would be racially oppressed. It was because you were of a specific type of group or a collection of groups that have been de designated one way and considered. Usually impurity was one of it, and it was spiritual impurity that was the uh, original monicum around um, feudal racism. And then it got more and more into biological stuff as uh, uh, science took its way forward and yeah and we and eugenics elaborated on that in the united states you know which is a source of eugenics which became one of the <clears throat> attributes of nazism as well i i, I guess was... uh you know german nazism was a combination of hegel american eugenics and italian fascism there's a lot of british eugenics in there as well oh, um okay it's That's definitely got the more violent eugenics of america um, but it also has like the uh, the scientific eugenics of like social Darwinism and stuff where it is yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Cause, I mean, that was what America was basing itself off. So like with the core elements of social Darwinism in place, you do tend to see some of that British, um, what, what would be the way of looking at it? Um, singular supremacy mindset. The US was just coming out of this around the time of the Nazis, actually. So before the 1950s, the US would only recognize itself as an Anglo-Saxon country. Hmm. It was a white country because it was an Anglo-Saxon country. Uh, the, the French and the white Spanish, you know, maybe they could play, but Germans, Italians, Irish and all them lot, you could fuck off if you think they're white until like 1920s, 30s, maybe. <laughs> and then even then, like Italians, no. Irish, eh, depends on where you are, not really. Um, you know, and eventually over time it changed. But for the British... They've never really like ever had to shake that mindset. They just stopped talking about it the way they used to. They're not representing it as virulently. So people don't feel that it's hmm, meeting the country's actual supremacy, blah, 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 you know, white supremacist bullshit. But the, um, what's it? Because it's basically just kind of morphed. It is all still there. It is all still intact. Instead of it just being this like, 
very obviously white supremacist thing. It's this sort of chauvinism of how the British are meant to be better than everyone. They've got a reputation, you know, they've got a, a fortitude, a responsibility to the world and stuff like that. And so instead they've kind of like transformed it into something else where they're the hero of everyone's story. Uh, and so it's still trying to keep that sort of Anglo-Saxon on top mindset, but it's trying to sort of cloud it in this smiley face reasonableism. Yeah. Uh, you know, this plays a, this is a big factor in the American, um, in the American civil society, because, you know, like America defines itself or did define itself as an Anglo-Saxon country. Okay. Then it became, you know, a Christian Anglo-Saxon country, nation state type. A deal. wasp nation. A wasp. Yeah. Okay. So, but underneath that, you know, you have 20, 27% of the American population is, you know, Anglo-Saxon, like from England. Okay, fine. But 26% are German immigrants, you know, from the lower class, German working class who came to look for some land and for, for some freedom. And they took it away from the indigenous population, of course. But that's what they came for. Then, you know, the commanding heights of the American economy main, were maintained by the Anglo-Saxon elite bourgeoisie. Okay. So you have all the war uh, uh, warmongers, you know, the war producers, you know, war factories being controlled by what sounds like Anglo-Saxon companies to me. And uh, and so, but the German bourgeoisie, i.e. Trump and others, were developing, yes. were getting rich, you know, and they resented the Anglo-Saxon control of the country, you know, and they began to think, well, you know, like this country should belong to them because, you know, after all, they are, you know, as American as anybody else, you know, and therefore, you know, like, why can't they sort of, you know, be the president of the United States, you know, instead of, you know, some Anglo, even though Biden is Irish, but he's, you know, the type of Irish who's assimilated to being. Oh, West Brit, West Brit. Yeah. Trump. So, you know, as well as I do, Trump is a lot more politically educated than he lets on. Are you oh, implying? Yeah, yeah his you wife said that he was reading that... uh, Hitler every night, you know, his bednight reading. Mein Kampf, so, you know, was his midnight reading. <laughs> okay, he knows what he's that, doing. That, yeah, no, because I, I, I picked up on this early on. Like, I noticed that Trump is just commenting on things that I didn't expect him to know. Like, um, he comes on the TV and he just mentions how Maoists and anarchists are taking over cities and he needs to stop it. This is during Black Lives Matter. And I'm just like, he just said Maoists, not Marxists, not MLs, not communists, not any, Maoists. This guy is clued in in a way that I don't think he should be, but he is. And <laughs> I, I was looking into it, and he, he's definitely read up Jackson stuff, like like Andrew Jackson, oh. um, because there was no way he was doing that work in school. Like some of the stuff his sister commented about him in the school days, and he was not in a, a very I'm learning the stuff that's going on at school stuff. So it's not just the, here's the pin notes that the school have told you about Andrew Jackson, because for anything, American schools would rather you not know how horrible Jackson was. But, um, you know, uh, so he's he's gone out of his way to learn that in his own time. So are you implying, working off of that basis, that part of his own, like, sort of, like, prideism in needing to take over the country might be related to his Germanness? Because, what, he's a, he's a, he's a second, second generation immigrant, right? Second his, generation, yeah. His yeah, father was yeah, because his dad came young. Yeah, his dad yeah. was, like, 20 or 30 when he moved here and he was a small businessman and then and he was like, he was like managed a refugee, to become big you know? bourgeoisie in like 20 yeah. years by being the, a, like, a bordello operator mm -hmm. that's where he made his money <laughs> he made it really fast though like by the time the 30s come he was actually a big cat and i'm like yo 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 i was just reading earlier in the tens that you were like basically a like shoemaker tier what the fuck is this capitalism surprises me sometimes like you know like some of the i've seen this with lumpen like like lumpen aristocrats and lumpen petty bourgeois people some of the ways that like uh exploiters can swindle the market blows my fucking mind sometimes i'm just like yo bro i i can't even touch the market without getting in debt what the fuck even is this <laughs> yeah yeah so well, as far as, you know, the ethnicity of uh, Trump is concerned, he's very conscious of it, you know, because I saw an interview and she said that he was very proud of his German blood. What does that mean? His German blood. Okay. And there's some sort of, you know, indication that his father was the son, 
Was it? Do you know he has Ireland? Scottish heritage? Scottish too. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So like, fuck. I mean, but he's you know he's probably not going to mention the Celtic blood because we have a tendency to kill fascists. So I don't know. Ah, <laughs> uh, my my. Okay. But the so... more about the SMP, we'll get to them eventually. The little fuckers. So he's 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 there. Okay, he's coming. And uh, he's won and this election, basically. I haven't seen the whole debate yet, but I've heard about like Biden being half there, half on cocaine. So like, um, yeah, I, I just unless the Democrats turn around and go, well, fuck, we need to change Biden out and they change Biden out. It, it's guaranteed to be Trump and Trump will win in not a landslide. Yeah, most likely. He'll yeah. win in a really close win. It'll be yeah. it's gonna be a one percent margin according to the polls. And I like really? mm. polls are not always the most accurate, but I, I think they're pretty accurate on this one. They've been pretty close with it with these close margins over the last few elections because the last election was close. Hmm. Because it's so close between the two of them, there's an electoral strategy that I was attracted to, which is the prospect of having the third party candidates like Dr. Jill Stein of the Green Party or Dr. Cornell West as an independent taking away enough percentage, you know, two, three percent, four percent, maybe five percent between the two of them to make sure that neither of those, you know, major bourgeois candidates have actually a majority of the popular vote. Now, the Electoral College, you know, will give them a majority one way or another. OK, fine. But if they don't have a majority of the popular vote, then the first step in their legitimacy under liberal democracy is gone. You know, they cannot claim to represent a majority of the people, and therefore they cannot claim to speak on behalf of the people in civil society. They can only claim to be the president. Do you not have a coalition system? Like, do you all not have a, have a, is it like by U.S. law, can you not form a coalition government? Because I've never seen a U.S. coalition government. Yes, I have. I've seen a coalition government, Democratic Republican. <laughs> okay, I get that part. I was going to comment on how that yeah. the U.S. government operates in coalition, but there's never like, you know, there's never like a we're going to join together as a part of the administration. It's just everyone's a part of the administration, which is not necessarily a bad system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, that you're talking about parliamentary democracy. They don't have that. They have an electoral college, which obviates the need for such coalition governments. Because See, it I forces, just, you know, one party to take a majority. Because, like, the idea of having a presidium, so where it's not like opposing parties sitting, facing, and rowing at each other, that's not a bad idea. But mm. I do prefer parliamentarism just for the fact that, I mean, I mean, look at the Soviet democratic structure. If you use a, a very sort of like strict but well developed parliamentary structure, you can make the 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 representative democracy of state socialism a much more stable influence system. I mean, so long as you don't, I don't know, maybe make a stupid mistake of shackling it to the party in the fucking way that maybe if the party turn, or the state turns revisionist, then the party will turn revisionist too. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've got problems. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, another, uh, another uh, context uh, where they always refer to situations. Another situation in Palestine, they call it a situation. We have a situation on our hands. Yeah, well, you know, you can call it a situation, but I call it a revolution. And uh, this revolution is gaining, is gaining, even though it's being pummeled by, you know, two-ton bombs and all that. Nonetheless, they've survived seven, eight months now engaging in resistance, direct confrontation with a military force by an insurrectionary force, which maintains itself in operation and which is even recruiting. <laughs> it's recruiting right under the fire, you know, of the Zionist military. Okay. Two, the Israel government has fallen. It's cracked up. And it's the prospects of the uh, Parliament, you know, breaking up, you know, and, and even, you know, like smaller pieces is there, you know, because the Supreme Court just uh, approved a motion to uh, conscript the Orthodox Hasidim, who are anti-Zionist, even though they were in the government, you know, such as Ash Party, you know, the Torah, Judaism, and all that. They supported the government of Netanyahu, even though they're anti-Zionist, because they're religious, they're Jewish, they're not Zionists, they're Jewish, 
And Jewish means that you cannot go and and uh, and go and kill anybody for no good reason. So they they cannot go into the military. They're supposed to be studying in yeshiva. And now they're going to be forced to leave the yeshiva. And if the yeshivas don't kick them out, they're going to be defunded by the, you know, the state that they've been relying on, you know, and they've been supporting in exchange for the subsidies. They've been supporting the Zionist governments. Oh, no more support for Zionist government if there's no more subsidies. <laughs> and if they try to touch the girls, oh, wow. first the boys, you know, Hasidim. And if they want to touch the girls and put them into military, oh, Oh, no way, no way, no way, no way. You know, these are supposed to be the mothers of big families. You know, no way can they go into the military to start killing Palestinians and children. No, this will not be tolerated. And how much uh, of the population are the Hasidim? Well, they started off, you know, as 400 families. Now they're like 20% of the population. Plus, you know, in the Israeli Jewish population, there's a potential, a revolutionary potential, because 50% of them are Arabs, Jewish Arabs from Jewish Arab countries, even though they don't speak Arabic anymore because they weren't allowed to, and Arabic wasn't being taught in the schools. Nonetheless, you know, like how long are they going to tolerate being treated as a second layer, a second caste, you know, undercaste of the population run by and controlled by the Ashkenazi population in spite well, of the figureheads they put uh... forward? I mean, a lot of them live in the same uh, segregated uh, mm -hmm. areas as Palestinians do. I know there are some that don't live in those areas, but they live in ghettos that are outside of those areas. So it's still run down, but they're not caged off. But some mm -hmm. of them live in the caged off zones. Um, Just to sort of explain with Israel, you kind of have people that are free, like the, the, the just the, the white Israelis, they, they get to exist wherever the fuck they want. I mean, if they mm -hmm. want to terrorize you, if they want to break into the caged areas, they can do that if they want to. They can do whatever the fuck they want. No one's going to really stop them yeah. um you know if the military man comes to stop them he's gonna beat the shit out of you for having you interrupt his day where he's having to get him and, and intervene with this stuff but usually they'll just stand and laugh um the uh second tier are gonna be people that are brown but may have jewish heritage they might be able to travel about and be free but they are restricted to redlining zones basically where they're put into rundown housing with poor mm -hmm. electrics poor infrastructure poor stuff like that and then you get tier three which is the caged off zones there's the segregated peoples that are like on a what is it like i think it's like past nine or something you know they're not allowed out the area and it's not until like early hours in the morning they'll let you out again either you're caged off and uh what's it the army will regularly just sort of like poke its nose in to terrorize the people in their raid houses and arrest people just to spook them hmm. there's an additional aspect of the social stratification that you're talking about that we're talking about and that is in the uh in the colonies in the west bank you know who yes. are subsidized to go there and live there and to make you know judea again it's the white Ashkenazi population. I don't see, you know, like so many, I haven't seen even one Jewish Arab amongst the settlers there. Well, that's the thing. You don't tend to see them there. You will see the, the Jewish Arabs that have always been there. The, most of the Jewish Arabs you'll find in like the West Bank are going to be Palestinian Jewish Arabs. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, wow. But uh, the, the settlements are purely white, purely yeah. white. And they're yeah. built like... Um, do you know what they remind me of? They remind me of the old Spanish colonial settlements that they would build. The um when they were settler colonizing places. The the what is it? It's like the um they're like pavillas. Hmm. So hmm. um kind of yeah, you refer, you refer sorry, to well. the uh to the Jewish uh, Palestinians who are different from the Jewish Arabs because the Jewish Arabs are are Zionists, but the uh, Jewish uh, Samaritans, the, the Jewish Palestinians who live in Nablus on the mountain, in Mount Gerizim, and who operate a liquor store there, actually. That's how they make money, and that's how the Palestinians get their liquor, you know? <laughs> Not just beer, but liquor, okay? And they have a good variety, too, you know? <laughs> so uh, they have, you know, uh, papers, you know, from the Palestinian Authority, from this, the Zionist state, and from the state of Jordan as well. You know, they're they're there. And they're considered to be Palestinians by the Palestinians, of course. Even I am considered to be Palestinian now because I've been there so long and I've taken enough risks, you know, 
if you risk your life, you're a Palestinian. That's about it. You know, like, you know, that's the proof, you know, if you're willing to go there and subject yourself to the same treatment as the Palestinians are being treated to, then Palestinians are very grateful. I mean, something that's very sort of similar to the Irish history is of a nation forged in struggle and chains. Um, you know, uh, there's many differences in the longer histories, but in the last 150 years, Palestine has been very much getting the Irish treatment from the Ottomans, the British, uh, the American-Israeli alliance and whatever the fuck was going on there. Uh, um, funny moment, the U.S. actually armed the Zionists to take over the British colony and the British were going to invade to like stop it. And that's apparently the reason why the Soviet Union wanted to sign the Israel Exists Accord in the U.N. rather than vetoing it like they fucking should have. Mm. Um just fight the British fucking cowards. They did this with Greece. I'm not going to lie. I know it might sound a bit unreasonable to say that after World War fucking two, but like there was real humanitarian reasons for them to kick the British teeth in. And I don't think the rest of the West were willing to protect the British at this time. Like should have fucking stood by those people and let the British stumble on their own shit. Cause they'd have definitely started the war, which wouldn't have looked good on them as it didn't with the fucking Suez. It didn't look good with the Suez. It wouldn't have looked good with the Soviet Union, but uh, they they were being tactical and they were thinking with something, uh, not their brain. I, I don't know what they were thinking with, to be honest. Hmm. But this uh, relationship, relationship of forces that uh, we've become uh, accustomed to in Palestine, you know, it's, it's, it's about the same thing, you know, like in terms of the world scene, you know, because... The first world, you know, like whenever they get into a difficulty, you know, with a given country, they go and bomb it. Yeah. Bomb Libya, bomb Yugoslavia, you know, like wherever they can, they, and they think they can get away with it. Even if they don't think they can get away with it, they'll still do it, you know, because they couldn't care less if they can't get away with Most it. Most damage, least casualties, less amount of manpower needed. Yeah. But there's something new happening now, you know, because, you know, the United States is feeding it's a long range missiles into the Ukraine and still offering the potential of NATO membership to the Ukraine, which means nuclear missiles eight minutes away from Moscow. Okay, Russia is saying, or Putin is saying, well, you know, if you want to arm Ukraine, that means we can arm our allies as well against any threat posed by the United States of America. So now Russia is preparing, you know, to arm who? Preparing to arm Hezbollah, preparing to arm the Iranian Revolutionary Guard in Syria and Iraq. Okay. Who else? You know, who else can? Oh, yeah, North Korea. Oh, yes. You know, Russia's going to arm North Korea. So if they try to, uh, you know, start a war you know, with uh, over Taiwan or to take over control of the, uh, of the strait between Taiwan, Taiwan and China, well, North Korea is there. And if South Korea, you know, wants to uh, make any provocations there, North Korea is there, you know, with Russian arms now. And then they even have a defense pact between them so that if North Korea is invaded, then Russia will come to their aid. Okay, this changes everything, not only on the economic plane with BRICS. This is now the military strategic plane military geopolitical strategy is now shifted because of Russia. Russia is not dependent upon the West anymore. They couldn't care less, you know, they've got sanctions on them and, the, and they can survive without the sanctions and grow. So they don't need to negotiate, you know, an end to the sanctions like Iran is, you know, thinking of doing. But the thing we see when imperialism starts to break its unity, which its unity isn't really truthful anyway. Like you can't really get true unity out of barons. Like barons want their keep and that's the main thing that they want. They don't really care about, you know, linking arms and skipping down the aisle other than the fact that they need to, to some degree. Well, when there's no reason for it, like there isn't at the moment, you start getting to the point where even the EU is just like, going do we really need america and it's starting to try and push its own way i mean lenin said it straight that the eu would be that that it would be something to challenge u.s imperialism yeah. and so 
what we're seeing is um, now the sort of different poles of the world are going their different way. Uh, either the US and the UK are going to like unite together and on the on the Anglospheric front, mm. or they're going to go their own ways as well. The EU mm. is likely going to leave NATO at some point in the next few years, and uh, Russia and China and uh, Brazil and India they're really sort of pushing uh, in the sense of trying to. Um, well, become international. Well, in the, China already is, but in the case of like uh, India and Brazil, become more international than they are currently are because they're very regional. And Russia's in a weird sort of semi position with that kind of stuff. They're pretty international so far, but they they want to increase their scopes in Africa. So a lot of these countries have got like lots of big foresight, but the problem they've got is there aren't many markets for people to move into peacefully. So mm -hmm. war is coming because there's no, it, it's why like nukes don't stop conventional war. It could never stop conventional war because eventually these people are going to want to fight for land. And what you're going to do, nuke the land you all want. Like that's a fucking smart thing. That's that spoiled brat tantrum edition of fucking, I, I, I can't play chess with you. Well, I'm going to break your chess pieces. Fuck you. I'm telling mom. And it's just like, no, uh, maybe someone might launch a nuke or two. That could definitely happen. I don't think nukes are off the table, but I think mad mutually assured, mutually assured destruction is not as likely as people seem to think. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, these these people they get carried away, and also they have automatic mechanisms, you know, that operate in, even if there is no orders. You know, like they probably have some AI controlling the deployment of nuclear missiles. Even an like AI that. though is more likely going to turn around and go, "Well, you don't need many of these; they cause so much destruction." <laughs> Maybe depends how they're programmed. <laughs> But I like oh I I just there's no the, the there's no need to launch all nukes at once, and I think that's just an unlikely use of them. I think if anything, they're going to be used quite like they were originally used, mm -hmm. or maybe they might even try start researching conventional nukes again now that Russia um specialized cold not sorry cold fusion that's some bullshit Nazi thing um fucking uh, micro fusion um. So they managed to make like stable, uh, like micro fusion, um, that could be usable for power plants. And as you know, anything that's technology that can be used for nuclear power plants is technology that can be used for nuclear weapons. And so mm -hmm. I could see this micro fusion device being integral to the creation of actually conventional nukes. That um, makes me shiver. Yeah. Well, you know. Fusion reactors are controlled. If they're not controlled, they explode. That's all there is to it. Yeah, but that technology is not as easy as it has been uh, played out to be. Well, actually, what the idea is is that if you can get something that can make fusion at such a small scale where it doesn't need as much heat and it's able to have stable fusion, you could use that to create a larger fusion of a bigger object by generating that hotter than the sun heat and then using that to trigger the other object. And yeah. then basically getting like a, a couple of kilotons worth of like nuclear fissile material going off. And then you've got a big dirty bomb to dump on the battlefield that will like fuck up everyone around it. Well, yeah, you'd have to sort of add on, you know, some sort of uh, some sort of you know uh, milieu that uh, you can use you an know, impact method. Um, there's an impact need, system for bombing. Uh, if you, it would have to sort of impact, you know, the heat would have to be impacted on the on hydrogen to fuse it into helium, in order to get. Uh, the release of energy that would be the result of fusion. Yeah. So it could um, be done. Yeah, I'm sure they're trying to do it, you know, but um, well, it's fusion hydrogen is very difficult, um, you know, to achieve, you know, on any level. And, and the micro level of, ooh, I don't think that's. Uh, well, Russia already has. They figured out how to do micro fusion. But, the, but then they haven't done a fusion reactor. Uh, they don't have a fusion reactor. There's one in China. There's another in Europe that they're trying to sort of operate, but China. So them. China has one. Russia. So they only did the experiments with this. They haven't actually built a fully functioning reactor out of it. But they, uh, they tested mm -hmm. fusion. Um, what's it? I. Uh, 
But nevertheless, still, fusion on a small scale is actually not surprisingly impossible. It's just trying to get enough energy density to go off on it is really, really difficult. So mm -hmm. we're nowhere near it yet, but we're at a point where it's something I would be concerned about. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what you think can't happen does happen. Two nuclear bombs have been released over civilian populations without an apology. Biden refused to apologize when he went to visit Hiroshima. They consider it to have been justified. And if they consider it to have been justified at that time, then what other time do they consider it to have been justified? It's not I mean, just what does that by anybody make else but the United States. And the United States decides for itself what's justified. What what kind of visit does it make it if like uh, he's not willing to apologize? What like a, a holiday to go celebrate a genocide? Is that what it is? Oh, it's a commemoration, the anniversary of the bombing. Yeah. Commemoration. Yes. Yeah, no, let's let's celebrate nuclear holocaust. Um yeah. fuck. Something that wasn't even dropped to defeat Japan, it was dropped to scare the Soviet Union and the Chinese yeah. communists. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to it, assert the world supremacy. An assertion. Assertion. It was literally like a flex. It was the it was like fucking dropping your gear on the table. It was a it was a, a card show. Mm -hmm. And they got giddy. They were they were already looking mm -hmm. forward to signing off the end of the war when they found out that they had these bombs left. And this, um, the president, uh, it was the one after um, I uh, what's it fucking Roosevelt? Uh, it was the one after it was Truman. the one after Roosevelt Truman. Yeah, that's Truman. It. Yeah. As soon as Truman found out, this was during the latter part of Potsdam. So this was about mm -hmm. the time the war was going to end. Uh, and he was willing to sign off for Japanese Japan to surrender. Uh, he got a letter, or no, it was a telegram. I, I apologize. Uh, it was a telegram saying um, that the bomb works and it had been tested off. This would be the Trinity test. And uh, he instantly just turned around and said, you know, drop them on Japan, like yeah. uh, drop both of them. Um, mm -hmm. And it was an experiment as well. It was to see which method was the best method for setting off nuclear bombs because yeah. the, the, they were literally the second and third detonations that ever happened. Yeah. And, and Japan didn't know it, but they didn't have any more nuclear bombs at the time. No, so they could have ignored no it. They had. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, Japan could have gone on the rampage. You know. But anyway, it was all useless. So they gave up. Okay, but... Uh, uh, you know the Nazis were trying to make a nuclear bomb. That's why Oppenheimer was working on the American bomb. Oppenheimer is, is Jewish. And when the bomb... You know, like he was developing the bomb, you know, in case, you know, Germany, Nazi Germany, you know, developed a nuclear bomb and he wanted to be able to develop it before Nazi Germany did. And that's why he was working on it. The but Nazis then, uh, fucking screwed up so bad. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, they, they didn't get into it, you know, at first, you know, because Hitler decided that uh, that Einsteinian uh, physics was Jewish physics and was not welcome in Germany. <laughs> so they were late in getting started. But then Niels Bohr was working on it, you know, because he didn't want his country to lose and be destroyed, you know, by an American nuclear bomb, you know, which probably he was right you know like the united states would have dropped a bomb you know like on Berlin Dresden for sure. happened instead which was pretty equivalent um yeah. but like you know um the germans were doing it all wrong um they actually were just like hanging like cubes of like uranium on like strings inside this what was supposed to be a reaction chamber that would trigger them it would never work their design was like stupidly overly complex and it would never get to the enough temp enough or high enough temperature to set off a fissile reaction and the yeah. uranium wasn't actually like uh, the weapons enough. grade yeah um it's supposed to be 93% uranium uranium 235 they yeah. didn't even have uranium 235 they only had uranium 238 <laughs> Yeah, because they didn't bother processing it because uh, all uranium-238 has some uranium-235 in it, uh, but it's usually yeah. about like 0.1% to 3%. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, and for an enrichment process, you can get that uranium two thirty five out of the uranium two thirty eight, or you yeah. can, or you can like fucking um, what's it? There's there's a few other ways of doing it. Plutonium's a good way to uh, yeah. um, get past the uranium problem. Yeah. But um, I I will say with the the Nazis. Um, one of the reasons why their ship was so cracked up, I nearly accidentally said cold fusion instead of small scale fusion. Mm. Cold fusion is um, well, uh, it's something that that same Nazi who was leading the uh, the the uh, Boers uh, when he escaped to was it Brazil or Argentina? It might have been Argentina. Um, he went on to produce a scientific paper talking about how he had discovered cold fusion. And yeah. when everyone else asked him to reproduce it, he was like, oh, you know, it happened in the lab. Um, it's it's the, the, the oldest fucking bullshit in the fucking scientific community. Oh, I got it in lab conditions. And so you're in another set of lab conditions. You're telling me that the, the, this lab is so different from yours. You couldn't repeat it again like motherfucker i will come to your lab we can just do it that way like it, it it was such an obvious swindle and i don't know how many people fall, fell for it but i'm sure a lot of people just sort mm. of looked at it noticed mm. it's this dickhead remembers it's the guy who can't even build a fucking nuclear bomb and just ignores him yeah. that's the hope yeah yeah poor open he seriously. called himself the angel of death or something yeah Oppenheimer is an interesting it. character. I got a lot of respect for Oppenheimer, even if he did build a nuclear bomb. Yeah. I still have to see his film, but in any case, what he said, you know, after the first bomb went off at Trinity, he turns to his brother and says, Well, it works. <laughs> that was it, you know, like, that's uh, the most autistic shit ever. Just like, Well, you know, it works. Yeah. 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 These scientists, you know, they can get carried away with themselves. Yeah. You know, fuck. I I would be a I would be a bit mesmerized though, because I've seen videos of nuclear bombs going off, and mm. shit for how devastating they are. They are beautiful. Like mm. it, it's like fuck fireworks. I I want to see that. Like that that's better than fireworks. I think fireworks are kind of gimmicky, but like, um, watch the Castle Bravo like nuke going off. Mm. Uh, um it's uh, a fusion bomb 15 megatons oh. and um the video for it has the sound of a b-52 uh bomber um in it the flying fortress uh -huh. and uh so you can just hear the drone of the engine as you yeah. just, like go and, and and it sounds like the noise is coming from the nuke it's not it's the engine and it's just the whole sky has gone red this just massive mushroom cloud and it is it's terrifying but it is so beautiful at the same time it is that that's the sun that you're seeing yeah yeah basically well, is so much energy is just being generated you know in either type of bomb you know what impresses me is that when it explodes it you know like an ordinary explosion when you see an explosion go off in gaza it goes boom then there's smoke that comes out you know and then it pummels upward you know because it can't go down but when a nuclear explosion goes off, the explosion doesn't end. It keeps on going. You know, it keeps on growing and going and going, you know, like 30 seconds. It can re-trigger itself because so, of the way, because uh, um, seismic waves collapse back in on themselves. Oh. And nukes are so powerful, they can basically like collapse in and out and have several seismic waves come out of the center of them because of the reflection rate. Wow. Wow. That, do you know the British once thought that they were going to like, that it would be a great idea to use nuclear bombs to excavate a bunch of land in New Yorkshire? Oh, Unfortunately, they didn't do it. You know, no, no, no. They'll probably be called in to do it, you know, to, to make the Ben-Gurion Canal, you know, right through Gaza to the Mediterranean to the Red Sea. That's where they want to use 25 nuclear bombs. They've already announced it. And they've calculated it, you know, 25, one after the other. Boop, 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 boop. And then, you know, the water... It will flow through and then that's it you know then you know like you know good business deal you know like not, a, not expensive <laughs> not expensive you know like <laughs> i'm just gonna buy yourself 25 nukes see i always thought the israeli government position was that they didn't have any nukes it's a bit interesting that they're able to commission nukes all of a sudden for a construction no problem no problem, no problem once they are they've exploded then they won't have any more nukes right you know by definition so you know they, they keep their word <laughs>
you all inter like literally after they blow them up, they go over, yeah. they go into national community. You have been asking us yes, to show no our can nuclear tell you weapons. The answer to your question is we don't have any more nukes. <laughs> this we've is used all them about all, or we say that we've used them all. <laughs> uh. Fucking oh god. It ah, oh, it's just like Okay, so what can happen there that'll change the, the situation? What can come in to help the Palestinians? You know, Yemen is doing a great job. You know, they shut down, you know, a third of the Israeli economy, economy you know, and by shutting down the port of Elat, okay, in the Red Sea, okay. What can Egypt do? Egypt is right there, you know, and they've made it impossible for Israel to expel the Palestinian population. They will not accept the Palestinian refugees into this Egyptian Sinai. Okay, that's settled. And, it, and the Zionists realize that now and they can't, you know, do anything about it because the Egyptian military is probably as strong as the Zionist military. And they don't want to have a war with Egypt at the same time they have a war with Hezbollah. That would be the that would be the end of, uh, of the state, right? But if there were a political change in Egypt, this is the time for it to happen. You know, CC has got to go. You know, all he's doing is, you know, like, enabling what? the zionists yeah he's just enabling the zionists you know like and, he, and is he is he forcing them to allow you know food aid into gaza from the rafa crossing no not doing anything there you know he's even allowed you know the zionists to take over the crossing you know entirely and allowed them to set up a philadelphia corridor where they're expanding as well all along the corridor <clears throat> border with egypt and gaza For if there were a political I... change in egypt then that would be you know that would break a break the back of Zionism. For all my criticisms of Nasser, one thing I absolutely love about yeah. the guy, one of a few things I love about the guy, is that, um, you know, in a situation like this, Nasser's Egypt would have invaded Israel October 2023, November at the latest. Mm. They would not have sat around. They would not have let this genocide go to this extent. They would have sent troops straight in. Where the fuck are the Arab countries and why the fuck have they not done anything? And then Iran, rather than actually helping out, they only get involved when Israel attacks them. Yeah. These countries are putting themselves first while Palestine is under chains and it's mm. fucking disgusting. Yeah. That's the and the people, the, a lot of the people in these countries, they like that. A lot of the people are protesting this stuff, you know, like the Arab people in like Syria, in Egypt, in Iraq, they're all protesting in solidarity with Palestine. They want these changes, but the fucking compradors in charge yeah. of yeah. fucking and the and the imperialists in the case of some of the regional powers, they're little shits. Like they 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 they're putting themselves first. They're putting their greed first. They're putting stability with the West first. All of a sudden, Saudi Arabia and like having good relations with them matters to Arab countries that has hated Saudi Arabia ever since it fucking existed. I don't not get that. Like, what the fuck is going on? Why ain't people got their shit together? We we supposedly got a country with a Baathist leader, and they can't even yeah, find their yeah. fucking mouth from their ass. Yeah. Well. This is a general phenomenon. You're referring to something that is uh, the reason, you know, what happens in a third world when you have a national liberation struggle, then it's a national liberation struggle. But when it wins and sets up a bourgeois state because they're in a popular front with the national bourgeoisie, well, then it becomes nationalism. Nationalism and national liberation are not the same. Nationalism is the I interest know. of that. Yeah. So I'm explaining to the to our listeners, you know, that nationalism is used by the bourgeoisie to promote the interests of the given nation state that they are yeah. in charge of. OK, and the national liberation movement, you know, didn't realize that they were going to be, you know, outmaneuvered by the national bourgeoisie, which was going to take the power away from them, even though they're the ones who made the national liberation in the first place. OK, like in South Africa, even. Yeah. Okay. Now, these nationalistic bourgeois nation states. In the third world, what have they done? First thing they do is up the production of oil exports, you know, to get money. Do they share yeah. it with the population? No. You know, they but don't they don't make their the economy. Yeah. They don't make their economy self-sufficient either. Yeah. Yeah. They just import everything because they've got the money. Huh. 
and they use the money sanctions for then change that i mean look what happened with cuba cuba ended up being essentially a sugar colony and then as soon as the soviet union's gone it can't get food and they're struggling oh, yeah. to ind individualize mm -hmm. their economy and then the u.s is roaming in and taking advantage of the situation yeah. if these countries yeah, yeah, yeah. made themselves more independent they'd be able to survive these blockades a lot better i mean it'd still be a struggle i mean like fuck the way we've set out uh, the world because of imperialism Hmm. parasiticness has made it hard to be self-reliant but at the same time there's a reason why the dprk has managed to for all my i got a lot of criticisms of it i don't see the dprk as a socialist country but at the end of the day they've still survived for a lot of stuff because of their hmm. self-reliancy because they have managed to make sure they can independently supply themselves of what they need yeah mm -hmm. um oh i had a thought what was that uh in terms of self-reliance, um, I don't see any third world country that's been able to do it yet. I mean, they've been able to sort of emancipate themselves politically. Economically, they've subjugated themselves, you know, to, uh, to their favorite uh, uh, contractor, you know, for the sale of oil. And meanwhile, you know, the, the world is being burned up with their oil and they couldn't care less, you know, because they're getting the money. So that's right now end. it doesn't exist, but Albania used to be a self-reliant country and uh, the DPRK, I guess, is the one of the examples today that exists. But even the DPRK is starting to become more reliant on countries like Russia and China. So it's like. Yeah, self reliancy doesn't exist in the in the Marxist sense at the moment. But uh, the Albanians, uh, when the when the uh, the uh, Alb Albanian Party for Labour was in power, mm. um, they they had a self reliancy program that was actually really ro ro rigorous and robust um, because mm. they have been they've been shunned by the Soviet Union when they were uh, on the side of the Chinese and the Sino Soviet split as part of the anti revisionist bloc. Oh, yes, that's what I wanted to tell you. When I was in Cuba in 2010, our guide was telling us what happened to Cuba when the funding was cut off from Russia, when Russia collapsed. Well, when the Soviet Union collapsed, okay? And, see, and she said that all of a sudden, you know, like her father didn't have any job anymore. Okay, so what did they do? You know, he, he uh, roasted peanuts, grew peanuts in a garden, roasted them, and then took them to another village to sell them because he was so ashamed to be selling, you know, on the street in his own village. And that's how his family survives. That's what happened to Cuba. That's such a fucking, like, I mean, hardcore response, like, fair play. Like, I actually just went and, like, just found, like, something that he could do. Like, I, I that's a really, like, rigorous and, like, very, uh, what's it, tactile way of trying to, like, overcome that problem. But, yeah, no, it, a lot of people don't seem to understand how bad the 1990s and the early 2000s was for Cuba. Mm. It was, I mean, a lot of people died. Like an, understood, like an understatement, I don't have a number on my hand and I don't really want to spit a guess out on a sensitive thing like this, but like a lot of people died, uh, not just in Cuba, but in a lot of places around the world. Uh, the Soviet Union had already long turned into a social imperialist at this point, but a lot of places in the world were still reliant on it, and so its collapse hmm. was still pretty devastating. It yeah. was the collapse of an empire, and I don't mourn that, but I do mourn the millions of people that died because of it. Yeah. And then all the uh, political support that uh, the USSR had provided to other countries was suddenly lost as well. So uh, <clears throat> the US... Uh... Or even just sold straight to the US. Yeah. It's just like a lot of industry, because a lot of Russian industry was sold to the US. So like um, a lot of Russian companies that were operating outside of Russia, inside of different countries now belong to the US. Wow. Uh, also the uh, 300 billion that's been ripped off from the... Uh gold reserves that Russia had in uh, Switzerland, uh, New York, London, and Canada, all that. Plus the uh, gold reserves of Libya are still being held by those banks. Plus Iran, they have gold reserves as, as well that have been looted. You know, the UK didn't originally want to do it for a reason um, that might not be initially obvious, but you might 
actually be a bit reminded by this term. Um, they uh, Russia is still the one of the largest investors in the euro dollar. When it was the Soviet Union, they were the largest investor in the euro dollar. Hmm. The euro dollar was Britain's little invention as a way to sort of get past the US dollar being the most dominant currency. Um, basically, it's a dollar that doesn't pay into the petrodollar. It's like petrodollar free dollar. Um, hmm. So you can uh, use it without the US gaining like mass profits. Because I think people don't understand what the petrodollar actually means is that the dollar is like not only just tied to the value of petrol, but the way that you use the dollar on the market is tied to petrol. So like if you could use an alternate dollar that's not tied to petrol, it doesn't affect the value system that they've got going on there. Therefore, not promoting the power of the US dollar, uh, undermining mm -hmm. it actually. <clears throat> yes, and and undermining its viability as well, uh, and uh, well, you know the British, the Americans' best ally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they hate each other. <laughs> Actually, they love each other too. At the same time, though, it's yes. so abusive. They need to see uh, a counselor. <laughs> okay, I'll refer them to you. <laughs> uh -huh. Fuck! I'll just like I'll I'll send them up for like uh, an asylum or something because they need to they need like a, a like four rounds of the nasty pills a day and something like that like fucking psychopaths. Well, first of all, tr try smoking them up. You know, maybe that'll help. You know. <laughs> Do you know what? Sometimes I feel that way. I'm like, yo, a lot of these people should just smoke weed. But then I remember Bill Clinton exists and he does smoke weed, and it didn't work on that motherfucker. Oh, He's just worse yeah. for some yeah, reason. It's not a good example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kennedy also smoked weed, so we already have two really bad examples there. Do you know what? That's the thing to talk about at some point. Um, it's not the topic of this discussion, but how shitty the Kennedys actually were, because everyone seems yeah. to celebrate them like they're these like big liberal politicians. And I'm like, yeah. no, I like fuck. I mean, Kennedy, uh, like fucking targeted unions like mad. He targeted his own people. The mafia yeah. helps get him elected, and then he targeted them by putting Bobby in uh, the fucking FBI uh, commissioner position. Uh -huh. Yeah. And he also he allowed the invasion of Cuba. I mean, he didn't yeah. give it, you know, full support. OK, fine. You know, but he allowed it. He didn't cancel I, it. I mean, the whole like saying he didn't give it full support. It was like what? Like his whole I'm against war in Vietnam thing was because he wanted a war in Cuba. Like <laughs> he actually said that that to uh, his internal cabinet that like, you know, we should mm -hmm. withdraw from Vietnam and then prepare for a war in Cuba. So yeah. any objection that he ever had to Cuba was because he failed to get an objection to NAM. And that's the only reason from my perspective, I'm saying here, yeah, I'm not, I can't speak for Kennedy is dead, but, um, yeah. <laughs> but that's what I see from it. I see it as like, well, there's no other reason for it because the whole reason he was anti-war was to start another war. Um, mm -hmm. Stalin actually like literally mentions that about social fascists, but I wouldn't even call Kennedy socialist. Like he's not, he's not really a social democrat. Like the guy's kind of just mid. He's like, he's like a, a like the old style Republicans, you know, the ones that aren't just like vapid racists twenty four seven. Oh yeah, yeah, Abraham Lincoln style. But imagine in the Cuban context, you know, like if the United States is putting. Uh, long range missiles into Ukraine, 2000 kilometer range missiles. Okay. Now, if Russia puts 2000 kilometer range intermediate missiles into Cuba, what is the United States of America going to do? Nothing. They can't do anything against that, I think. That's going to be, you know, a determining factor. They could do that, you know, if, as they have, you know, said that they're going to do, you know, because. United States is putting its missiles into the Ukraine, so they say they're going to put their missiles into their allies. And to put them right next door to the United States, like they've done to the Russia, ooh, that would be That's a little, statement, nice little yeah. lesson. Yeah, I expect that to happen. Yeah, I expect it to happen, but I also expect at some point or another, one of the imperialists are going to try and write a deal that will try and ensure that conventional war can occur. The one that will basically sanction the usage of nuclear weapons, like the actual firing of them. Mm -hmm. 
I think that might come to be soon just because of the nu nuclear terror. And I just think that there's going to be a lack of like tolerance of it this time. It's not going to be like the eighties. Think about it. We all have these uh, fucking libraries of fucking Alexandria in our pockets that we just bummy around with. We're too knowledgeable these days. So it's not going to be like the 1960s to the 1980s where like you just need to go bang and everyone's running and hiding under their desk. Like it's, people are going to be a lot more socially aware. And so it's going to get to a point where a lot of people are going to stand up and say no to the uh, usage of nuclear weapons. However, mm -hmm. I don't think as many people are going to be as opposed to conventional war. And mm -hmm. I do think that the West wants a conventional war. And if they want a conventional war, they need to make sure that no one's launching nuclear weapons, which means they're probably going to need to make a, a deal that they would consider unfavorable that would basically just sanction the usage of them entirely. Mm -hmm. But it would provide them the ability to have a conventional war. Um, China and Russia, especially China, China being the new rising, like, like uh, you know, power, superpower at this point, um, if we look at that, then we're going to see that, well, they're going to want something that ensures that the U.S. doesn't throw a tantrum and destroy the territories it wishes to profit off of. So there's like an urgency to ensure that, you know, MAD doesn't become a thing. And if the U.S. does strike, that the only strike they give back is a retaliatory strike that's equivalent. Um, and that's what I think is going to happen. I think there will be the possible, very high possibility of nuclear launches, but I do not think it's going to be mad. And I think people should be careful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, when uh, the first world countries are in a uh, position of decline and they know it, then the only solution for them is war. And they're willing mm -hmm. to do it. That's what's always happened. And that's Something Lenin happened pointed now. out was that war, like the imperialists, when they can't peacefully take over new territories hmm. they will go to war with each other and uh, like the world war is a, a scrup scrupulous term it's not really one we should use it's easy to use though because it's colloquial and like average people know it you start going around and going the great imperialist war of 1940 you've lost them already but they're, they're imperialist wars truthfully if we're going to go on a theoretical basis and so like what we're seeing is the rise of an imperialist war and if people think that the bourgeoisie are going to go oh no there's nukes let's not have a conventional war people don't know the bourgeoisie like mm. they need to, to to stabilize themselves and to stabilize themselves means they need to take over territory they need mm. to expand and mm. how do you expand if everyone's got all the chess pieces everyone's got all the territory where you guys start taking territory mm. by force yeah yeah you know you can see that happening in palestine in the west bank colonization project that's what that's africa's gonna be a hotbed for it it already is at the moment i mean somalia yeah. you've got yeah. the situation going on in the congo in sudan yeah they um, don't have to put boots on the ground they just have to put uh, money into the pockets of a mercenary force well, the UK and the French, they have boots on the ground in Africa. Uh, mm. You know, Kenya is basically like a UK military like outpost. Like oh. there's there's like the capital city of Kenya is full of U UK troops. Um, and so like and the neo-colonization of Kenya by the British after they stopped being a direct colony is still very like rampant and powerful in that region. Really? Well, they're facing a revolution that's happening right now in Kenya. So yeah, that, you know, hopefully, hopefully they kick the British out because yeah, there's a lot of British they, troops you know, there. The example is there; they've just kicked out the French troops in Mali and Niger. Even that's that; they're gone. That's the end of that. Thank you very much, you know, for a very important and interesting discussion here on the Convergence video stream. And uh, I'd like to mention that we had a very interesting discussion about the character of the student revolt and the character of students in, the, in class terms. And I think that's a very important discussion. There was a debate around that that took place in the Fourth International when I was in the Fourth International, actually. And it was, one, it was Mandel and his faction that refused to consider the students to be a revolutionary force. And it was the... Uh, North American sections, the um, uh, canon faction, in effect, uh, that considered that the uh, students had uh, revolutionary potential. 
So that's a very important debate, you know, and may not have been considered to be, you know, an important debate, you know, by other participants at the time, but it is a very important debate. And I want to put that video back up on the uh, channel, on my channel and on the channel of the Bundes movement. But I have to cut off the end section of that video first, you know, because it was disgusting, disgusting to see, you know, how there were objections being made to such a, uh, an obtrusive manner at that time. And so I promise you that I will get that discussion back up without the, all the junk that follows, you know, thereafter. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, we can always also re revisit the discussion again, because like, I'd be happy to get down on that because I, I don't think it's so black and white either, because they can be both the lower petty bourgeoisie and have revolutionary potential and be useful for the struggle. Lenin talks about the you know the difference between like class traitors and fellow travelers and the the radical and nature and importance that fellow travelers can bring to the table when they're there for a little bit when you have the carrot about but eventually their petty bourgeois ass might show and so you need to give them a good beat with the stick um so yeah all that stuff you know like we should get back into you know because you know we have to determine you know like who are our potential allies you know because we don't don't want to get sucked into some popular front, you know, with with a, a class compromising, you know, uh, concessions being made. I appreciate that. And so that's why our discussion is so important. Well, it gets into like um, the two different kinds of United Fronts. You've got like the United Fronts of the specifically proletarian organizations, you know, like anarchist Marxist stuff like that. But then you also have like the United Front with like social Democrats and stuff, which is a mm. uh, United Front of proletarian and petty bourgeois interests. Mm. In effect. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, looking forward to the election in uh, France tomorrow. I'd love it if this new uh, popular front that they call, you know, like actually got enough votes from the Macron people to beat out the fascists and they became the government of France. Oh, wow. That means no French troops being sent to the Ukraine. That means no money. That means no NATO, oh, this is interesting. This is very interesting. This is not some social democratic, you know, like splash. This is a tidal wave coming forth in France. And I'm looking forward to that, you know, and everybody's looking forward, you know, to the fascists winning the election, you know, but no, 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 no. I'm holding out, you know, for the popular front there. Let's I think you hear a lot of Americans talk about it and they only seem to mention the far right taking over. Oh, and yeah, I'm like, yo, no. yeah. And then the new popular front starts like a few months ago and it's already like the second most popular in the polls, like of as of three weeks ago. So yeah, who knows where they are now? Yeah, they were at 28% against 35%, you know, for the fascists. So I think that can change, you know, in our favor, you know, before tomorrow. This is the thing is that the Americans, they will, rather than trying to form these like united fronts, they'll just sit there bitching about these groups and not just getting the shit done. Like it's kind of the, it's the same with the UK. Like rather than us having something like this set up, we're too busy bitching at each other and it's just not yeah. useful. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. We're set to go and I'll see you next week. And hopefully there'll be some other people who have something to say. They'll come in from the convergence as well. Because, uh, uh, we, uh, you know, I would love, you know, like uh, Marco, you know, in Italy, you know, he's a new member of the Convergence and he oh. has operated a pro-Palestinian uh, website, you know, since ages and has given me the opportunity to be translated into Italian there as well. I hope he jumps in, becomes more active in Convergence and Steve, you know, is there as well, you know, like he should get connected in here too. So then that would make the discussions, our discussions two times and three times even more dynamic okay this is it for today here the 6th of july in the year of 2024 and uh we have the prospects before us that never existed before until this last couple of years we're experiencing something that is a tidal wave of protest and it is uh palestine that is generating it so we can look forward to um what we've been talking about you know because what we've been talking about is happening very good bye for now love and solidarity